Hi guys, we are going to talk about chapter 40 today. Um, this is nursing care of the child with an alteration in gas exchange and respiratory disorders. And we are just going to get started here. As we look at the anatomy and physiology of the child's nose and throat, um, we can focus on the nose first. Infants noses are much smaller than that of an adult. They are obligatory nose breathers. They don't really produce a lot of mucus unless they have an infection. They are more susceptible to those infections. So we do have to be aware that when they do produce a lot of mucus, um, it's really obstructing those nares. Um, we do know also that their sinuses are not developed. As we look at their throat, they are at increased risk for airway obstruction. An infant's um, tongue is large in relationship to their oropharynx, which can lead to that airway obstruction. Children also have very enlarged tonsillar and adenoid tissues, which can also lead again to that airway obstruction. If they are large enough to cause obstruction, we may need to think about removing the tonsils and the adenoids. So with this picture, you can see the differences in the adult versus the child. They do have a smaller nasopharynx and nares, which just makes it more easily occluded during infectious periods. Their tongue is quite a bit larger, which again puts them just at risk for obstruction. And they do have that floppier epiglottis, which can um, result in just some swelling to that area. The diameter of an infant's airway is approximately four millimeters um, in contrast to the adult's airway, which is about 10 millimeters. So if you're thinking about um, that, that opening, that airway opening, um, it's definitely much smaller um, in an infant and child versus the adult. The airway lumen is smaller in infants and children than in adults. So when we see edema, when we see mucus, um, or if we see bronchospasms, that air passage is greatly diminished, which results in an increase in resistance to airflow, causing an increased work of breathing. We also can see that the distance between structures is much shorter, which, allow, which just allows organisms to rapidly move down that shorter eustachian tubes. And we've already talked about our eustachian tubes being much shorter um, and going more horizontal, which just increases our risk for those ear infections. Smaller numbers, and they also have smaller numbers of alveoli, which just puts them at higher risk for hypoxemia. So let's look at the upper airway. A child's airway is highly compliant, making it susceptible to collapse during airway obstruction. The trachea is shorter and it angles to the right bronchus more acutely than the adults. So the location of the trachea at the third thoracic vertebrae in children as opposed to the sixth in adults. So this difference is really important, especially when we're thinking about suctioning our children and assessing for that risk of aspiration. So if we do have an aspirated foreign body, um, where is that likely to land? And then we have to, have to think about that right bronchus. Children do have a significantly higher metabolic rate than adults, and that just increases their need for oxygenation and oxygen. Respiratory rate is faster, and their demand for oxygen is higher. So young children develop what faster? And if you can just read through that, you're gonna know that they just develop hypoxemia much faster. So what are some of the symptoms of hypoxia? Um, this should be very familiar for you. If we're talking about early hypoxia, you can think about rat. Um, they're restless, they are, maybe have some anxiety, maybe some tachycardia or tachypnea. If you're seeing late symptoms of hypoxia, you can think of that pneumonic bed, um, bradycardia, extreme restlessness, and maybe even some dyspnea at that time. So let's start with assessment um, of our patient. Remember that we're gonna start with the least invasive to most invasive. Least invasive being um, inspection and observation. 
So the first thing we're going to look at is the color. Um, we can look for pallor, which is just that pale appearance. We can look for cyanosis, which is that blue tinge to skin and mucous membrane. It is important to note that is that cyanosis centrally located or more peripherally located. We can also look at acrocyanosis. And we talked about that being very normal for our newborns, um, but it's that blue tinge to the hands and feet because of slow circulation. We can look at the rate and depth of respirations. Tachypnea is that first sign of a respiratory type illness. If they're having any bradycardia or bradypnea, that can be a very ominous sign for this patient population. As we inspect and observe the nose and oral cavity, we're looking at nasal drainage. Is there any redness or swelling? Is there any blockage or obstruction? Cough and other airway noises, um, if they have any grunting, that usually occurs on expiration and is produced by a premature glottic closure. Um, any atelectasis or diminished air sounds, those are when those alveoli are collapsing. You could also hear crackles when we auscultate. Strider is an inspiratory high-pitched noise and it's usually a sign of an upper airway obstruction. We also wanna look at respiratory um, effort or work of breathing. Um, is it labored or is it unlabored? Are they using any use of accessory muscles? So let's talk a little bit about accessory muscles here. So when you hear the word accessory muscles, you should automatically think about retractions. That's that inward pulling of that soft tissue with respirations. And you can see retractions um, subcostally, substernally, intercostal, suprasternal, supraclavicular, and even up to as high as nasal flaring. We also want to document, not only do we want to document where we're seeing the retractions, but we want to document the severity. Is it mild retractions, moderate, or severe? So when we go back to our inspection and observation, we can think about anxiety and restlessness, right? They go hand in hand with respiratory issues. I think if you ever think about you just feeling short of breath, it makes you feel a little bit more anxious. Um, the next thing we wanna look at is clubbing. So when we're looking at clubbing, um, we're looking at that, that's from chronic hypoxemia. Um, it's a change in the angle of the fingernails to the fingertips. Hydration status is that last thing that we're gonna check on and that's dehydration. Um, if we're talking about dehydration, that may increase the respiratory rate just in an attempt to oxygenate their body. Um, fontanelles could be a big indicator of hydration status. Remembering sunken fontanelles indicate dehydration. Um, you may see less mu or tacky mucous membranes or maybe the presence of no tears. So as we continue with our assessment, the next thing we want to do is auscultate. Um, when we auscultate, the couple of the adventitious breath sounds that we might hear are wheezing. Wheezing is a lower airway obstruction. It usually has a high pitch on expiration. Um, crackles is the other one. Crackles may be heard um, when the alveoli become fluid filled. They're a very wet sound um, from usually something like pneumonia. So again, here are your lung sounds. Um, crackles, ronchi, and wheeze are the different adventitious lung sounds that you may be hearing. Some of the common medical treatments for respiratory disorders um, can include oxygen. Um, we can use a nasal cannula, simple face mask, or maybe even a non-rebreather in severe cases. Make sure we have those correct leader flow rates that are appropriate. Um, we want to definitely use high humidity. That's just going to be very essential to preventing drying of those nasal passageways and helping liquefy those secretions. Suctioning is another medical treatment that you'll see, especially with our infants, because it's really hard for them to just clear those passageways. And remember, they are nose breathers, um, so they're depending on their nose to be able to breathe. Chest physiotherapy and postural drainage, 
um, is that clapping of the hands on the chest. Um, you may also see vibration vests, um, congestion in the lungs. A lot of times they use these with our CFRs. Um, you can also see chest tubes and maybe even bronchoscopy. So remembering this should be familiar for you, um, just the methods of oxygen delivery. That first picture there has that simple face mask, provides about 40% oxygen, there's no bag reservoir, and our leader flow is going to be about 6 to 10. Nasal cannula is that middle picture there, provides an additional 4% oxygen per one liter, um, and we're usually only going to go up to about 4 liters on our pediatric patient population. Non-rebreathers are partial non-rebreathers, um, has that, depending on that small plastic covering, um, these provide about 80 to 100% oxygen, and our flow rate's going to be 10 to 12, maybe even up to 15 liters. So what are some risk factors for respiratory disorders? Um, prematurity is definitely a risk factor. Chronic illnesses such as diabetes, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, congenital heart diseases, chronic lungs are all going to be risk factors. Um, developmental disorders like cerebral palsy, passive exposure to cigarette smoke, immune deficiencies, crowded living conditions, or maybe even daycare attendance are all going to put our patients at higher risk for respiratory illnesses. So let's look at a, some acute infectious disorders. Um, we're going to, you can see a laundry list there. We're going to really focus in on pharyngitis, croup, RSV, and pneumonia or bronchitis here. So as we look at pharyngitis, um, we can talk about two different types of pharyngitis. The first one is viral. These are usually your mild cold-like symptoms, very self-limited, doesn't respond to antibiotic therapies because it's viral in nature, and we're really just going to treat our patients symptomatically. So lots and lots of supportive care. When we look at strep pharyngitis, that's a bacterial illness that we can collect from a throat culture. Um, it does require antibiotics for this one. You're going to see that sandpaper rash, petechiae, abdominal pain, vomiting. Um, it's typically not associated with any cold-like symptoms. Um, and remembering that if we don't treat it, it could cause some rheumatic fever. So as we assess for our pharyngitis, um, we want to definitely check when was the onset. Um, a lot of times that comes on abruptly. If you've ever had strep throat, it comes on super fast. Um, I can remember the one time that I've had it. I literally woke up with it like on a Saturday morning and by noon, it was, it was horrible. So it does come on quite fast. You're usually going to have fever, sore throat, maybe some difficulty swallowing. They may also complain of headache or abdominal pain. They also may have what they call that strep rash, which is just kind of that fine rash that's on the extremities and the trunk. Um, their throat is going to be very erythemic. Um, there's going to be some exudate, ulcerations, maybe some enlarged tonsils, and you'll see that petechiae on that soft, soft palate. So nursing management is going to just promote comfort. Um, we can talk about salt, saltine, uh, sorry, saline gargles, some analgesics, whether that be Tylenol or ibuprofen, um, popsicles, cool liquids, ice chips. Remembering that throat's really sore, they're probably not going to eat or drink anything, but anything that you can get in them for hydration is perfect. Um, make sure we're providing any of our family education. They have to finish all of the prescribed antibiotics if it's a bacterial illness. It's usually a 10 day course. They're gonna start feeling better after a few days. Make sure you really educate to take the entire um, course of antibiotics. For them to go back to school, they should be on the antibiotics for at least 24 hours and without fever. We also wanna think about changing toothbrushes and toothpastes so that we're not reinfecting each ourselves. Um, and again, school precautions are 24 hours after antibiotic therapy, as long as they have been fever free. If we have multiple um, strep illnesses, we may think about tonsillectomy. Um, children's tonsils are typically larger than adults, 
and they're usually visualized pretty easily. A tonsillectomy might be warranted if we do have those recurrent strep infections. Tonsils that are touching or potentially obstruct the airway, sometimes called kissing tonsils, um, they may need to be removed. When tonsils are removed, they're more, more than likely we're also going to remove those adenoid tissues too. Both of those tend to cause airway obstruction. So after we've had the tonsils removed, we have our patient back on the floor, some of the things that we can think about as nurses, we want to make sure we're promoting airway clearance um, by placing that child in a side-lying or prone position. Um, airway is always our biggest concern, and these positions will help facilitate drainage of any secretions. Another major focus is just maintaining that fluid volume, um, discouraging um, coughing, um, encouraging fluids, but again, we want to make sure we're not giving any um, citrus fluids, brown fluids, red fluids, right? It's going to mimic hemorrhage back there. Um, hemorrhage is usually un unusual, um, but it can occur any time between surgery until about 10 days out. So just being aware of that coughing could hemorrhage. Um, the brown or red fluids may look like hemorrhaging, so just avoiding those. As far as relieving pain, we can do an ice collar, maybe some analgesics with or without those narcotics, and then making sure we're educating our families. Um, knowing that day seven through 10, we do have a higher increase risk of hemorrhage because those scabs start falling off. So what do we need to watch for if we're concerned about that? What do the families need to watch for if we're concerned about that? They're gonna see increased swallowing, which just might indicate some bleeding, or if they're seeing any blood in the mouth, then they need to make sure they're being seen by a provider. The next one that we're gonna talk about is croup. This is a viral infection that attacks the upper airway. Um, the infl there's inflammation and edema to that larynx and trachea. Mucus production can also occur, which just further contributes to the obstruction. So we've talked about it being an upper air respiratory infection. Um, they can have significant strider at rest, um, severe retractions after several hour period of observation. Symptoms usually occur mostly at nighttime. And when we think about treatment, we think about high humidity areas. So taking them into the bathroom and turning on the shower to really hot water. Um, if the child has strider at rest with persistent retractions, they may need to have a racemic epinephrine given, which is nebulized epinephrine. Um, that's gonna help control some of that swelling. We will watch the child for a few hours after that racemic epi, just to make sure there's no rebound swelling that does occur. So this picture again just shows you some different croup symptoms. Um, it usually is a slow onset, usually occurs at night. Um, they have that barking cough. Sometimes it sounds like a seal cough. Um, you have that inspiratory strider. Um, it usually progresses to a more hypoxic state. Um, sometimes they will have a fever that can get up as high as 102. It usually happens in kiddos less than three months, or sorry, three months to three years of age. Um, again, it is an upper respiratory illness. Um, so that is croup. Sometimes we can manage croup at home. Um, the concern is the edema to the larynx and trachea. So just making sure that if they do have croup symptoms at home, that we're keeping them quiet um, we're keeping them calm or discouraging any crying. If we're in the hospital setting, we're doing the same thing. We're not starting an IV. We're not suctioning them. We're not um, irritating them so that that, that edema gets worse. Um, we want to make sure we're encouraging rest and fluid intake. Again, the steamy bathroom is a great place to go. Um, sometimes they'll order corticosteroids to help with some of that inflammation. And then just making sure that the parents know they have to closely monitor um, respiratory rate, retractions, difficulty breathing, lip cyanosis, cough or strider that's not improving or any drooling, then they need to contact their primary care physician at that point.
So when we look at epiglottitis, this is a life-threatening disorder due to increased occlusion of the epiglottis. Um, visualizing the throat or inserting anything into the mouth could cause laryngospasm, which would just precipitate immediate airway obstruction. Um, if we are at all concerned about this disorder, we do not want to attempt to visualize the throat, leave the child unattended, and we do want to place the child in supine position, usually high fowlers. What we want to make sure we are doing is providing 100% oxygen in the very least invasive manner, um, and then ensuring that we have emergency equipment available. Um, that's a possibility that emergent tracheostomy, um, if that airway closure continues, may have to happen. Some signs and symptoms of epiglottitis, we can think about air raid, um, air inflammation that can cause obstruction, um, increased pulse, restlessness, um, retractions may be present. They definitely probably have some anxiety, inspiratory strider, and drooling. Drooling is our classical symptom. Um, remembering we're not gonna visualize the throat, we're gonna put them in a position of comfort, which is usually supine high fowlers, we're going to humidify the air and we're going to have that emergency equipment at the bedside. So you can see the difference here in croup versus epiglottitis. They are both upper airway disorders, but they have very big differences. So just make sure you're aware of those differences in croup versus epiglottitis. So let's move into bronchiolitis or RSV. This is very much a small childhood disorder. As adults, this would be a common cold. It's highly contagious um, viral infection that occurs during the first two years with the peak occurrence usually between three and six months of age. The onset of illness um, is usually with a clear runny nose, um, pharyngitis, low grade fever. Um, then they usually develop a cough for one to three days into the illness, followed by wheezing shortly thereafter. Most of the time they are very poor feeders because of all of the congestion that they are creating. Um, Cold-like symptoms that usually last for a day or two, the cough worsens, the wheezing begins, lots and lots of secretions. Um, it progresses to a rapid shallow breathing with retractions and nasal flaring if we don't take care of it soon. So this is just our normal bronchiolitis pathophysiology. You can see those normal bronchial tubes there, and then those that are um, overinflated with that air trapping there on the right would be your bronchiolytic um, tubes. So as we look at diagnostics and lab tests for RSV, um, some of the things we can think about with treatment, we're gonna do a pulse oximetry that's verifying our oxygen saturation you might see a decrease significantly depending on where they are in the illness. We may do chest radiography um, that could reveal hyperinflation um, and patchy areas of atelectasis or infiltration. Blood gases might be drawn, which could show carbon dioxide retention and hypoxemia. And the swab that we're gonna do to test for RSV is a nasal pharyngeal swab, and that's just gonna positively identify that our patient does have RSV. As far as nursing care for our bronchiolytic patients, we're gonna follow strict precautions, um, making sure that we're not spreading that infection. We can do cool, high humidified oxygen. We're gonna suction these kiddos quite frequently initially. Um, we may have to do small frequent feedings and fluid intake because of that increased congestion is gonna be increased work of breathing. So making sure we just do small frequent feedings. We really wanna cluster our care to just promote that period of rest. So as we look at pneumonia, children with pneumonia can appear very toxic or sick, but generally recover very quickly from this. It is an inflammation or infection of the bronchioles and alveolar spaces of the lungs. Patients with RSV may develop secondary pneumonia because they are both those lower airway disorders. Pneumonias can be viral, bacterial, or mycoplasma in origin, bacteria being the most common. Pneumonia may be that 
secondary illness that is bacterial from a viral illness. Signs and symptoms usually come on abruptly. Um, fever, cough, increased respiratory rate, lethargy, poor feeding. Um, they usually have those wet sounding um, lungs. As far as therapeutic management, we're gonna do bed rest, hydration, antipyretics, um, possibly some antibiotic therapy. Goals are gonna be supportive care. Um, we're gonna support hydration, help thin out those secretions, allow the child a position of comfort, administer pain medications for any discomfort. And then family education is gonna be just really making sure the importance of administering those antibiotics if they're prescribed and completing all of those medications. Um, lots of these symptoms may last for several weeks um, so making sure they're continued to hydrate and treat symptomatically if needed. As we look at labs and diagnostics for pneumonia, um, pulse oximetry again, oxygen saturations might be decreased significantly or they could be within normal ranges. We may do a chest x-ray and that's going to vary according to the child's age and causative agent. Um, you can see on the pictures there that that picture A shows an infiltration which would indicate the pneumonia where the second picture is just a normal x-ray so you can see that white out of that pneumonia there. Sputum culture may be useful in determining the causative bacteria especially with our older children and adolescents and then we might do some blood some white blood cell count might be elevated in the case of bacterial pneumonia. So that concludes our acute respiratory disorders. Now let's move into chronic respiratory disorders. Um, those disorders can include allergic rhinitis, asthma, chronic lung disease, cystic fibrosis, and apnea. And we're gonna focus on this chapter with asthma and cystic fibrosis. Treatments don't really differ much from the adult world, so we will get through these relatively quickly here. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic condition that affects airway. The walls of the airway become inflamed, muscles tighten, and less air flows to the lungs. Um, we may have increased mucus production. Um, what are some of the symptoms of asthma? Wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, chest tightness. And then what are some of the factors that put individuals at risk to develop asthma? We can think about genetics and environmental factors. Asthma uh, medications is a stepwise approach. Um, if our patient has symptoms more than two times a week, we may add medications to their regimen. So we may start with a short acting beta and then maybe a steroid and then add a long acting beta as the child improves. We may back some of those medications back down. Some children have seasonal asthma symptoms and medications increase automatically at just certain times of the year. And this slide just shows an asthma action plan. Um, so you can see the green, yellow, and red zone. Green usually means they're doing very well. The providers will list what medications that they might need to use during their well time. Um, again, it's stepwise. So if they move into that yellow zone, we're gonna add some medications. As they move into that red zone, we may add more medications. But as they improve, we're gonna go back to our yellow, back to our green where those medications are just being taken away. As far as asthma management, um, again, it's a tiered system based on the severity of the asthma. Rescue medications may be um, short acting bronchodilators where our maintenance medications are gonna be our inhaled corticosteroids and our long-acting bronchodilators. When we think about teaching for asthma, um, it's gonna focus a lot on medication and how each of those medications might be administered. Um, dry, powdered, and discus um, might be your steroids. Um, nebulizers are your machines. Um, you can see that in the picture on the bottom there. The meter dose inhalers are those inhalers that you have and then just making sure that we use spacers every time we use our inhalers. You as nurses will have the opportunity in your nursing career, career to administer each of these medications. So just be aware of how they get administered. Some asthma triggers are listed here. 
what are those environmental agents that could trigger an asthma attack, and that's going to be very individualized for our, each patient. Um, could be things like dust, pet dander, cigarette smoke, activity, sometimes even illness is just a trigger for some of our patients. So this is just the asthma, just recap here. You should be pretty familiar with asthma. It does have an increase in familial tendency. It occurs more in males, um, affects five to 10% of our children. The symptoms are listed there on the right. Cough, increased mucus, shortness of breath, expiratory wheeze, um, prolonged expirations, retractions. Um, we wanna just make sure we're getting those medications on board. Albuterol is our fast-acting inhaler. Um, it can be with a nebulizer or it could be with an inhaler. Um, they could go into status asthmaticus, which can just be life-threatening asthma attack that just won't um, give up. And then here is your pneumonic asthma when we're thinking about management of asthma. Um, the A is the beta-2 antagonist or agonist like your albuterol, steroids, theophylline, hydration is important when they first arrive. Um, oxygen can be done with a mask. The better option might be a nasal cannula because a lot of times if they're older than their mouth breathers during this time. Um, and then our anticholinergics can help dry things up. You can also see our little guy on the picture is sitting on a peak flow meter. Um, that's good good thing to do daily or even twice a day. It just really helps um, our kiddos understand how ill they really are. So if they're hitting that green zone, their asthma is clear and, good, and under good control. If they're hitting more that yellow zone, it signals some caution. Asthma is not well controlled. Maybe they need to call the provider. And definitely if they're in that red zone, there's probably some severe airway, airway narrowing that's occurring in medication or maybe emergency department is needed. So let's move into cystic fibrosis. It's one of the most common debilitating diseases of childhood. Um, it is an autosomal recessive trait, meaning both parents have to pass it on to the child for the child to have the disorder. If only one parent passes it on, it, they would be considered a carrier for the disorder. So when we think about the presentation of our CF kids, um, as far as respiratory, you are going to see wheezing, obstructive emphysema, maybe some atelectasis. You may see some cyanosis, <coughs> um, clubbing of those fingers and toes because of um, just long-term hypoxemia. The pancreas, um, those ducts become blocked and enzymes cannot adequately digest their food. And as far as their bowels, they have that stutteria, which is that increased bulk. Um, they have frothy, foul, fatty stools. And that is a very classic symptom of pain, uh, cystic fibrosis. Some of the labs and diagnostics that we can think about. Um, the main one is gonna be your sweat chloride test. It's, um, you can see the picture there of how they actually take that. Remember, they have excessive chloride, so they have that salty taste to their skin. Um, if they take the sweat chloride test, it is considered suspicious if the level of chloride collected in the sweat is above 50, and it's diagnostic if it's above 60. We will put on a pulse oximetry um, that might, their oxygen saturation may be decreased um, particularly during a pulmonary exacerbation. Chest radiography may show hyperinflation, bronchial wall thickening, atelectasis, or infiltrations, and their pulmonary function tests might reveal a decrease in forced vial capacity and forced expiratory volume, which just increases in residual volume. As far as treatment, um, chest physiotherapy is going to happen multiple times a day. It's usually going to be the vest that they put on, um, and it just really shakes all of that mucus up. Inhaled um, Dornase Alpha is just a pulmonary enzyme. Um, they're going to have these that pulmonary enzyme to help with a lot of their respiratory symptoms. 
They may do inhaled antibiotics for exacerbations if they're in a really severe exacerbation. Pancreatic enzyme supplementation. Um, remember that their pancreas um, is blocked and it does not um, adequately digest foods. So before every meal, they're gonna take these pancreatic enzyme supplements. So again, just a recap of our cystic fibrosis. Um, symptoms can include fatigue, chronic cough, recurrent URIs. Um, they're gonna have thick, sticky mucus. Um, they're not gonna be able to absorb those vitamins and so they're gonna be put on those enzymes. Some of the treatments that we can think about, our diet's gonna be high in calorie, high in protein. Um, we're gonna do breathing exercises, um, chest physiotherapy, aerosol treat therapy. With our meds, <coughs> excuse me, we're gonna have antibiotics, inhaled antibiotics, especially if we are in an acute exasperation um, state. Um, we're gonna supplement our vitamins. Um, we're gonna do bronchodilators, mucolytics, um, and we're definitely having those pancreatic enzymes before every single meal. Um, this disease does not go away. We do have to work very closely with the family with the progression and outcomes of this disorder. So interventions to minimize psychosocial impacts of chronic respiratory conditions. Think about your asthmatic kiddos, your CFers, right? Lots of psychosocial can go along with this. So we want to make sure that we can um, short-term manage and long-term manage these kiddos. Um, provide the child with self-esteem through education and support. Making sure that we have age-appropriate education to help them take some control back from their disease management. Promote family coping through education and encouragement. They may need very long-term um, management. So we may need to focus not only just on the patient, but on that entire family and help them support, be supportive. And then provide culturally sensitive education and interventions. Um, not only if you have a chronic illness and you've got some psychosocial things on, but let's throw another piece of the puzzle to it and cultural. Um, so making sure that we stay culturally sensitive if, we, if the culture also becomes um, a factor in our disease process. And that concludes chapter 40 on respiratory illnesses. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Otherwise, we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.